what were some of the books that you really felt like this book like propel me to where I am today that you would recommend wholeheartedly to anyone that you care about? Is your crypto working for you? It can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time-consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to possess advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros with the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk-reward ratio, but also your assets are protected by our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver returns? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites. Special edition Dubai, the crypto millionaires. We're going to talk about success, the mindset, and not just crypto, and then move into all the geeky stuff that you guys all love. So without further ado, I'm here with a very good friend here in Dubai, Sammy from Four so, Flies. Pleasure to have you, bro. How you doing, man? How you doing, brother? Good to be here. Very good to be here. Thank you. Sammy is a ledge here, a very, very knowledgeable guy. And you, most of you guys may not know him, but if you don't, he has a very cool YouTube show, which you definitely has to check. The link will be here below. But without further ado, Sammy, the first question I really want to ask you, we've talked about your youth. We've talked about some of the difficulties, the struggles. And I think that's a perfect starting point, you know, for people to get to know who is the real Sammy. What has he been through before succeeding? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't even know where to start. I, <laughs> uh, I started out with the YouTube videos when I was uh, like eight, nine years old. And from the beginning, like in school, I always wanted to drop out. I, I never really enjoyed it. I got the basics of the education done. And then it was homework. It's like compliance work, actually, you know, like all the homework and stuff. And, and I just didn't want it. Uh, I wanted to leave since I was like 10. And eventually I did. Yeah, I kind of I started making YouTube videos. I was uh, I, I traded started trading at 15. Um, and that took me to yeah 17. I dropped out. That's the that's the elevator pitch of what happened. And, and now I'm 19 here on this yacht in Dubai with you. That's so amazing, man. Let us know a little bit about that specific story. So you were 17, were you rebellious? Like, like what was that moment where you're like, forget it, I'm done with school, I wanna drop out and yeah. I wanna live the crypto life? It happened somewhere over here on the palm in Dubai. Bitcoin went up for one of its final rallies up to $7,000 before crashing to 3,000. And I, uh, I, I knew that this, this crash was coming, so I ended up selling a bunch of it. And, uh, and, and at that point, I went to my mom. I said, hey, look, I think Bitcoin's going to go down. I just made a shitload of money. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go to Dubai. Because I was, what, like 15, no, 16 at this time, something like that, 17. And, uh, and she said, no, it's too expensive. I said, OK, and I booked it anyway. And we stayed on the palm, right? And, and so somewhere around here, I had a great time. Uh, you know, it was like $5,000 at the time to me at like 16, 17, it was crazy money, but I could afford it. I felt like the man of the house. I felt like I was providing for my family and stuff like that. Uh, at, at a young age, I really felt like I made it. We had a great time, everything paid for by me, food, whatever, hotels. And then I came back to London and this was the end of the Christmas break in like 2018 or whatever. 
I came back to London in January and first day it's like, where's the homework? Where's the coursework? You know, we've got to give you a detention now. I'm going to call your mom because you didn't do this. And that was the point where I said, fuck this. I, uh, I've had enough, <laughs> you know, like I've, I've, uh, I don't think I need to do this anymore. And by this point I had my car, I was paying the rent. So, you know, like my mom couldn't really argue with it. She didn't like it, but she couldn't really argue with me at that point. So. Was that like the biggest pleasure for you, like in terms of success, not not just, you know, trading and making great profits, but giving back to your mom and, and showing showing her that you're the man of the house and you can provide for her. Is that the biggest satisfaction or what are the some of the happiest moments when going through this thing? Man, there, there's there's quite a lot because um, obviously it started happening quite early and there were little steps, right? So like the first time I really made some money, I took my mom out to a restaurant where the bill came to 80 pounds and it was shocking because we were on welfare at the time. So um, like that, that was a big milestone. I was like, yeah, now my mom's eating good food. You know, it was in central London. Nice. We, we never used to live in central. So, um, so, so there, were, there were different milestones. Yeah, one of the big ones was starting to pay the rent and, and the bills and stuff like that. And obviously it's great because uh, she actually went through cancer and a bunch of other stuff, uh, health issues for like when I was 13, you know? So uh, she worked hard as a, as a single mom, you know, and uh, and now her only job is to relax, so she's earned it. That's amazing. Growing up with a single mom myself, you know, I really see her as a superwoman, and I'm sure you see your mom as a superwoman, and can't be more uh, thankful and grateful to have, uh, you know, our moms always back us yeah. at all these times. And what made you believe, like, you know, so you were there, you're like, screw this, I'm not taking this school, I'm not taking these ho this homework, this compliance stuff, you yeah, know, anymore. Yeah, yeah. I want to live my own life. Like, what were the kind of elements that helped you on your path to success, right? Like, were there some habits? Was it a mindset? What really built you to the Sami of today? The, the primary one was mindset. I think once you have that locked down, everything else is, is open to you. Open to you yeah. So for me, it was Ty Lopez. Actually, he kind of set it off for me. Um, he's very smart. He showed you the reward. Here's my Lamborghini. Here are the books. I should do that now, actually. <laughs> and, um, and, and you know, he, he started off with that, which immediately is different to school because school is all about, here's your punishment, get the grades. And, and so it was that contrast. I really wanted to, 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 you know, hit it big when I was younger. And seeing people like Ty Lopez, seeing other people who, you know, like seeing even movies like Wolf of Wall Street, right? Uh, just seeing very wildly successful people, I started to think what, like, started to wonder what's possible. And, and then for me, it was, it was reading books. That's what allowed me to build the mindset. Um, I, I had the loser, classic loser mindset, you know, before everything is everyone else's fault, nothing is my yeah. fault, I hate my life, all this bullshit. Uh, and, and then, yeah, you know, like I started reading these books at 14. It was a very young age. I got very lucky to start reading those uh, self-development books because it, uh, like, that is the perfect age to, to learn it's things perfect. like... perfect. Your yeah. mind is developing so much, yeah, right? Yeah, especially when that reward is in front of you because now you're receptive yeah. too. So that's how I started out. It was the whole mindset thing. Uh, that led to habits, a really, really strong desire of wanting this life. Um, that was a big part of it. You know, like if you don't really work to it, it's probably just because you don't want it that bad. You want to say you want it, but you don't actually want it. So what were some of the books that you really felt like this book, like propelled me to where I am today that you would recommend wholeheartedly to anyone that you care about? So The Success Principles by Jack Canfield, 67 steps to get from where you are to where you want to be. I don't think I'll ever forget that title. That was the first one I read. And I wondered, where do I find these books that Ty Lopez says I should read? So I Googled, who's somebody I like? Actually, there's an epiphany here. I, uh, I, I realized, I remembered, that everyone has the same 24 hours in their day. Some people spend it shooting up heroin, and some people spend it building Microsoft. So I, I thought, right, like I'm, not, I'm clearly not doing something right with my 24 hours, because <laughs> I'm not shooting up heroin, but I'm not sailing on yachts. So. I asked myself, what does Bill Gates do with his 24 hours? And I saw an interview of him a few days ago. It was just right place, right time. I was just getting the right stimuli in. And, uh, and he said he reads books in the morning. So I figured, right, what does, Gates, what, does, what does Bill Gates read? And it was this book, Success Principles. Uh, this is just basic life principles that, you know, anyone by age 25 should know, at least intellectually, maybe not. Maybe they haven't internalized it yet, but they know they exist. Uh, again, at 14, it was very influential. Uh, and it was also in that book, he shows you examples of people who've done it. And he drills like one principle would be take responsibility, forget about the blame. And, um, and then he would give you like five really hard hitting examples of how that changed someone's life. So again, it, it was a lot to, to influence me. That's number one. Number two, 
Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, yeah you know it, man. Of you course. It's, it's, a, it's Hill. a great book. Yeah. Uh, I, I listen to it over and over and over. It's um, and it's not about money. This is the thing that people yeah, don't really yeah. get. Yeah, rich is the mindset, yeah. right? It's yeah, yeah. Well-being, like you said, you know. It's everything. It's everything. It's about giving you that burning desire. You know, exactly. you said, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta really, really want it. There's no plan B. Yeah, obviously, you know, be sensible, but there's no, you know, that that kind of energy. Burn and, the bridges behind you, all that stuff. Right, right, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and practically speaking, no, don't do it. But <laughs> like in, emotionally in your head, yeah. That's why I, it's kind of why I dropped out. I was like, okay, let's go. This is it. Now I'm free. Uh, and yeah, that was that was a huge one for me. Too. The questionnaire at the end with all these questions that I, I use it every single year to re-question yeah. myself, you know, just to make sure that, like you said, you talked about habits, building the right habits. It's incredible. That book is just mind blowing. Yeah, from A to Z. Yeah. yeah. So that that's super cool. We talked about your upbringing and you know having difficulties with school and like, screw this. And then what are the things that influenced you? What are the habits, the mindset that you've built for yourself? And then crypto hits you, like Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Like like what 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 was that transition? You know, from one guy thinking, okay, I want to succeed, but now I'm gonna choose crypto. Crypto was just part of getting there, man. You know what it was? So I, I wanted to get into Bitcoin when I was way younger, but all my life I was running businesses since like 13, but I couldn't do it legally because the system screwed. And so I had a lot of age restrictions. And for that reason, I, I just started feeling kind of depressed when I realized I couldn't do something because of my age. And that's how I felt about Bitcoin when I first heard of it in like 2012. Like I lived on the, I grew up on the internet, so I could have bought it in, in 2012. Uh, but then I found out actually a friend of mine who used to make tech, I used to make like phone reviews, mobile phone reviews. I found out one of my friends bought Bitcoin. He turned like $13 into 200. I was like, yo, if this guy can do it, maybe he can show me how because he's a friend. And he did. Uh, and, and it was, that was it. I bought a 10 pound, $10 course on Udemy from Superman. And it, it was an okay, it wasn't, it wasn't a terribly good course, but it gave me what I needed to start. And for that, it's worth a million dollars to me. And from there, it was reading books and, and that was it. It was just the next step in, in, in my journey, I guess. And I always had the YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel is just whatever I do in my life, I would, I would talk about it. Fantastic. What are the strongest arguments pro Bitcoin that you've heard up to now? Like, were there any like specific videos or things that made you think that's no. the why? No, not yet. No, no, it's not, it's not specific videos. It is looking at your own government wherever uh, you live, especially if you live in the West. And that's your reason to buy Bitcoin, because if you're uh, unlucky enough to be in the US, you know, like read about the gold bullion seizures, stuff like that. That's what made me, uh, you know, like really see the potential in Bitcoin. First, we get attracted by the sexy profits. Then we stay because we have to educate ourselves. Yeah. And um, I love the fact that, you know, I can't get seized by anybody and, and the government can't touch it. You can just memorize all of your money in your head and you can fly to bloody any country in the world and no one can touch your money. So, you know, it's a big deal right now in 2021. A lot of us grew to, uh, to dislike our governments more and more last year for good reason. And, uh, and, and that is the reason, in my opinion, that Bitcoin is so good. It's plan B, it's the alternative. It's the alternative. And you mentioned, so like, you know, people your age, the generation Z, right? Is that what really drives them the most? You think what they find the most attractive? It's just like, rather than looking directly as Bitcoin as solution, it's more the problem, the current problems that governments are projecting where the, the youth are like thinking, screw this, I can't trust the system anymore. And I, I need this as a solution. So more looking towards the problem than the solution. You know, I, I'm not so sure that the youth, um, broadly speaking, see those benefits. I think for most people, uh, and, and, and in more and more frequencies as you go younger, it's just the profits just that the is profits. interesting. And then it's, you know, like, uh, like a funnel, some of those people will get interested and some of them will read books like the Bitcoin standard and then they will educate themselves. But I really don't think at any point in this spectrum that there is uh, a large mo movement of people specifically interested in it because it's a good hedge against the government. If that was the case, we would have never crashed from 20K down to 3K. So um, I, I, and I have very strong opinions on that. But the good thing is as the gains come in, we just start reading about it. So. Every 100,000 people that come in, I don't know, 5,000 will become initiated and, and understand what, what's actually going on with Bitcoin and why it's, you know, so useful. And, and, and actually, one of the biggest ways I see it being useful is as a pressure tool, because, uh, you know, you'll talk to other YouTubers and other people and they'll say Bitcoin will become the world reserve currency. And you'll talk to me, I'll say, no, like, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. 
it's too far-fetched. But what I think it's going to do is kind of like, you know, you're in a democracy and now a third party is coming up, applying pressure and saying, look, we got to we got to keep the planet green. We got to have good environmental policies. This Bitcoin, us, the community, we are the pressure group telling the government to fuck off and uh, and let us live our lives with peace. You know, and, and Bitcoin is a very strong vote in that direction because it's our money and, and money is, is is the only thing these guys want. So. That makes a lot of sense. So is it really, like you said, the plan B? So it won't become eventually the global reserve currency, but it's more an alternative of expression, of freedom, that's, of people just, it, that's what it is? Look, I mean, more and more people go in that direction. Now you start getting people in parliament and government offices, you know, saying, hey, look, we got to make our, our books more, more publicly visible, you know, so people can see what we're spending on. Just little examples like that. That's Bitcoin having an influence on the rest of the world and the government in a very real way. I don't see it becoming anything hugely, hugely significant like a world reserve currency. And a big reason for that is I'll ask the viewers, I'll put the viewers on the spot and break the fourth wall. How many of you guys actually know, uh, you know, like the ins and outs of, of, of a public key and a private key and things like that? How many of you learned reluctantly or learned excitedly and, and things like that? And, and, and that really uncovers like a lot of people, they don't want to be their own bank because yeah, yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, all, yeah. yeah. And if you mess it up, you're broke. Yeah. So, so it's not like the stakes are low either. So um, no, I, I just think it's a protest, man. And, and it's a protest that makes you money. So it's pretty good. I love it. It's a protest, freedom of speech, freedom plan B against the government's plan. And it makes a lot of sense. It sounds more like it's a movement, right? It's a form of expression than actually becoming a global reserve currency. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I just think like it's, a, it's an absolutely phenomenal store of value. It's a great way to transfer value from A to B because, I mean, there is no A to B, right? Like it's borderless. And um, I, I see it replacing gold. It's, it's better at being gold than gold. That's where I see Bitcoin in the future. It's not 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 uh, not so much to, to replace the dollar or anything like that. That makes a lot a lot of sense. So guys, that was part one. Stay tuned for part two. We're gonna talk about some geeky stuff, talk about technical analysis, and tons of really cool insights with Sammy from Four Flies. So definitely do not miss out, and catch you later.